The prize, based on my book of the same name, tells the timeless story of global oil. Our story begins with the birth of the industry in Western Pennsylvania in 1859 and continues into the 1990s and then with a new epilogue. It's a tale filled with larger than life characters, of great ambitions and bitter disappointments, of fortunes made and lost, of relentless competition and burning rivalry, and of turning points in world events where oil was so crucial. The prize is about oil's role in international politics, the clash of nations, and war and peace. But it's also about the rise of the global economy and the modern corporation. Yet it tells another story too, the hydrocarbon society in which oil not only makes the world go around, but its products are so embedded in the fabric of everyday life. The 20th century has rightly been called the century of oil. How the balance plays out between the modern way of life fueled by oil, the requirements of economic growth and increasing population, geopolitical turmoil, and environmental concerns. That balance will be key to shaping oil's role in the 21st century in the epic quest for oil, money, and power. McClure's Magazine, New York, October 5th, 1903. Dear Mr. Siddle, I have your letter of Sunday morning suggesting that I come on for next Sunday. It would be better for me to slip in and out now without any notice. I should rather that no one would know that I was in town. Of course you understand. Very sincerely yours, Ida M. Tarbell. For almost two years, the journalist Ida Tarbell has been investigating one of the richest and most powerful men in America. His fortune was made in Cleveland, where Ida Tarbell is now going to meet her researcher, John Siddle. Dear Mr. Siddle, you may expect me Sunday morning at 7.15 on the Lakeshore Limited. Ida Tarbell's journey ends at Euclid Avenue, the millionaire's row of Cleveland. She heads for the Baptist Church, which is further down the street. The man whom she is investigating is a prominent member of the congregation here. This will be the first time she has set eyes on her quarry. John D. Rockefeller was the richest man in America. He was the man who created the Standard Oil Trust. He was the man who, more than anybody else, made the modern American economy. And he was also the very symbol to most Americans of monopoly and one of the most hated men in the country. He'd taken great pains to be as unknown and as secretive and as invisible as he possibly could be. Inside the church, Ida Tarbell and her researcher are joined by a sketch artist from their magazine. We were sitting meekly at one side when I was suddenly aware of a striking figure standing in the doorway. At that moment, Siddle poked me violently in the ribs and hissed, There he is! 
There was an awful age in his face. The oldest man I'd ever seen, I thought. The impression he makes on one who sees him for the first time is overwhelming. Brought face to face with Mr. Rockefeller unexpectedly and not knowing him, the writer's immediate thought was, what power? It's not a shifty eye, not a cruel or leering one. It's something vastly more to be feared, a blank eye looking through and through things and telling nothing. The cruelest feature on his face is this mouth, giving a look of age and sadness. Mr. Rockefeller may have made himself the richest man in the world, but he has paid. Nothing but paying ever plows such lines in a man's face. When she started the series, no one would talk to her. They were scared. They were afraid she was either going to sell out to the oil industry, that either she was the tool of John D. Rockefeller, as they felt some of their neighbors were, or she was going to do such a, such a series, such an expose, that they would get in trouble. They were afraid. I soon discovered that numbers of men and women were afraid. Go ahead and they'll get you in the end, I was told by more than one. Even my father said, don't do it, Ida. They'll ruin the magazine. Ida Tarbell's search for the truth about Rockefeller was to have a dramatic and far-reaching impact on the industry that has shaped the 20th century. There's a river called Oil Creek in the misty hills of western Pennsylvania. Petroleum oil would seep to its surface. The Seneca Indians used it for war paint and to caulk their canoes. Petroleum had no commercial value until the coming of the white man, when Seneca or Seneca oil came to be used as snake oil. Before 1859, oil was called petroleum, of course, uh, which was sort of its scientific name, but it was also known locally as rock oil, as Seneca oil. Uh, most of the oil was used for medicine. It still is used to uh, treat burns and open sores. Oil was supposed to be able to cure everything from rheumatism to fevers to the sores on the back of your mule. But you could do something else with it. You could refine it into a product called kerosene and make an illuminating oil. Until the invention of the oil lamp, light had come primarily from candles and tallow. The wealthy had used whale oil in their lamps, but it had become too expensive. So there was a need in the market for some new source of illumination. And the question was, could this stuff called kerosene, made from this funny product called rock oil, could that become the new illuminant? In 1854, some samples of rock oil were collected in western Pennsylvania. Tests showed that it would make first-class kerosene. If enough rock oil could be found here, it could be sold cheaply and capture the market for lamp oil. So a group of East Coast investors hired a man and in 1857 sent him to the muddy little town of Titusville, where he checked into the American Hotel. Colonel Edwin Drake had come to explore for oil. Colonel Drake was not particularly qualified to be an oil explorer, but of course no one at that time was qualified to be an oil explorer. He, his qualifications included the fact that he was a retired railway conductor and could travel for free on the railway because he had a pass. Drake was no real colonel. His military title was meant to impress the local backwoodsmen. There were already derricks in the area. The locals used them to drill for salt. Drake's well would adapt these salt-boring techniques to oil. To begin with, Drake had little to show for his efforts. The local Titusville residents were very skeptical of Drake's endeavor. Uh, they knew that there was oil to be found along the creek. I mean, that had been known for centuries. Uh, 
but they thought the idea of drilling for it was lunacy. At the end of the first year, money was running short and Drake's backers were growing impatient. Then in the spring of 1859, he hired a former blacksmith called William Smith. Uncle Billy, as he was known, he was probably as good a person as Drake could have found for the job because he had all the necessary skills and knowledge to drill a well. Uncle Billy's nephew later helped in this meticulous reconstruction of the world's first oil drill. It was now summer, and the investors were about to give up. But Colonel Drake had the idea of using a pipe as they drilled. This was the forerunner of modern casing. Then on Sunday, August 28, 1859, oil bubbled up the drive pipe. Uncle Billy and his son Sam bailed out several buckets of oil. On Monday, the very day that Colonel Drake received his final payment and in order to close down the operation, they hitched the walking beam to a water pump and the oil began to flow. The first oil was to sell for $40 a barrel. Years later, a local newspaper interviewed Uncle Billy about the day they struck oil. I commenced drilling, and at 4 o'clock, I struck the oil. I says to Mr. Drake, look there, what do you think of this? He looked down on the pipe and said, what's that? I said, that is your fortune. Drake's well proved that by drilling for it, oil could be found in abundance and produced cheaply. Overnight, a whole new industry was born. Before long, in millions of homes, farms, and factories around the world, lamps would be lit with kerosene, refined from West Pennsylvania crude. When the word came out that Drake had struck oil, the cry went up throughout the narrow valleys of Western Pennsylvania. The crazy Yankee has struck oil. The crazy Yankee has struck oil. And it was the first great boom. It was like a, a gold rush. Down in Pennsylvania, A, there is plenty oil, they say. Petroleum, petroleum, we must all have some. The oily fever, don't you see, infects most air. It was a crazy time of boom and bust. In two years, one well paid $15,000 profit for every dollar invested. Then overproduction drove prices down from $10 a barrel to 10 cents a barrel in just one year. Among those who came to the oil region was a family named Tarbell. The father was Frank and the mother was Esther, and they had a little girl who was three, and her name was Ida. The Tarbell set up home in Cherry Run. Dirty, violent, and sleazy, it was a combination of the gold rush and the Wild West. Ida would later recall what it was like to grow up amidst the mud and the stink of an oil boom town. About us rose derricks, engine houses, and tanks. If oil was found, every tree, every shrub, every bit of grass in the vicinity was coated with black grease and left to die. Tar and oil stained everything. What had I come to? As mother realized, a place of perils. A derrick inviting to adventurous climbing at the door. The creek rushing wildly at the side of the house. Great oil pits sunken in the earth not far away. But Ida's father, Franklin, was a joiner by trade, and he knew how to make wooden barrels. Oil was stored in barrels. Oil was already measured in barrels. Oil was transported in barrels. <laughs> 
Teamsters drove it to Oil Creek in barrels. There, the barrels of oil were loaded onto barges and floated downriver to the refineries at Pittsburgh. They couldn't make barrels fast enough. Franklin Tarbell was in the right place at the right time. There weren't barrels enough to be bought in America, although whiskey barrels, turpentine barrels, molasses barrels, every sort of barrel and cask were added to the new ones made especially for oil. Capturing this gooey stuff was more of a challenge at that point than finding it. Franklin Tarbell was a bit of a tinkerer, and he figured out a way to make a tank for oil. So he developed wooden tanks and had a business called Tarbell's Tanks. He was a success, and before many months, he was buying thousands of feet of lumber, employing scores of men, and working them and himself day and night. If you look today at, at the old pictures of the region of that day, you see Franklin Tarbell's tanks everywhere. And Franklin made, in a very short time, more money than he conceived of making in a lifetime. Gushers, sprouters, and fountain wells were making fortunes overnight. Tales of rags to riches were celebrated in songs like Oil on the Brain, Paws Struck Oil, and Oil Fever Gallop. But before long, the wooden tanks on this sheet music were obsolete. Metal tanks proved a better way to store American petroleum. One of the visitors to the oil fields in the 1860s said he had never met so many people who had been so enriched and so ruined, and usually they were in the same people and in such a short period of time. When you look at the photographs of the oil region from the 1860s, you see that everybody was drilling next to their neighbor, as it were. The wells were uh, practically on top of each other. The oil industry in those early years operated by the rule of capture. And the way to think about that is a milkshake. And everybody puts their straws in and gets around it and sucks out as much as they can before the other person does. And so they put all of these different wells because you wanted to get the oil out before the guy next door got his oil out. And what it meant is that the fields were very badly managed from an engineering sense and often would deplete very quickly because of this really rampant overproduction. Oil fever reached a peak after the Civil War when they struck it rich at a place called Pit Hole. Ida Tarbell's father was one of those who joined the rush. The news caused a wild scramble. A motley procession of men, with and without money, with and without decency, traveled on foot or horseback up the valley of Cherry Run in full view of our home. John Wilkes Booth lost money here. While at the Danforth House Hotel, a certain French Kate made it. Oil on the brain. Then, after just 500 days, the oil gave out. Men who had bought steam engines and rushed them to the oil fields by express delivery had to sell them for scrap. parcel of land that had sold for two million dollars in the boom days would be auctioned off for four dollars and 37 cents 12 years later. By then, Pithole was a ghost town. It had cost sixty thousand dollars to build the town's fanciest hotel. Franklin Tarbell bought it for six hundred dollars tore it down and moved it to Titusville, where he used the lumber to build a handsome family home. And here, surrounded by French windows and fine doors, iron brackets and moldings, Ida Tarbell spent her childhood. It was 1865 and she was eight years old. By now the railroads had come to the oil region and to nearby Oil City. It seemed like good news to the local producers and refiners. But the coming of the railroad meant that Cleveland, 150 miles away, 
began to compete as a refining center. John D. Rockefeller, a 16-year-old with a head for figures, had gone to Cleveland to start in business. As I began my business as a bookkeeper, I learned to have great respect for figures. Grandfather never finished high school and went to Cleveland having borrowed $1,000 from his father to start uh, business, paid 9% interest on it, incidentally. And he read about the oil business just beginning and got interested and came to realize that it was uh, a very volatile business at the time. By the time he was 26, Rockefeller and his partner owned an oil refinery. He was always very conscious of cost. It has always been my rule in business to make everything count. One characteristic of Rockefeller was saving a penny wherever he could, knowing that in a continuous process manufacturing industry, a penny saved is a penny saved a million times. It's over and over, a cheaper barrel, a cheaper way of refining will give you a cheaper product. Rockefeller plowed every penny he earned back into the business. As refinery number one grew in size, it gave him tremendous advantages. This was the first refinery, the first modern plant where there were great economies of scale. The unit cost, the cost of getting a gallon of, of uh, a production of a gallon of kerosene went from six cents a gallon to three cents a gallon. And you couldn't do this without the volume. No one could compete unless they had the same volume. And this was new in the world. This economy of scale increased Rockefeller's bargaining power with the railroads. In this period, transportation costs were a very significant part of total cost. The transportation cost from Cleveland to New York City is roughly equal to a cost of a barrel of oil. So those who understood that and would aggressively pursue uh, lower costs in transportation would have a tremendous competitive advantage. By now, three competing railroad companies were serving Cleveland. This meant that Rockefeller could play off one against the other. But getting a special rate would have to be done discreetly, because the railroads were common carriers and were supposed to charge the same rates to everyone. In those days, the railroads had, had set the rates, or the competing railroads, uh, and the way you cut the rates was not to tell anybody, uh, but give a rebate. He got a very good rate, his rate was $1.30 as opposed to $2, and that was a rebate of 70 cents. Who is entitled to better rebates from a railroad? Those who give it 5,000 barrels a day, or those who give 500, or 50 barrels? With his own fleet of tank cars, Rockefeller was such a big customer that the railroads had to give him special rates. By the late 1860s, the oil business was in a deep depression. Prices had collapsed and the entire future of the industry seemed to be in peril. The tall, thin man in the wide-brimmed hat was disgusted by the chaotic and wasteful overproduction in the oil region. The butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker began to refine oil. The price went down and down until the trade was threatened by ruin. To save the new industry, he felt he would have to eliminate his rival refiners. He saw a chaotic situation. He felt that the only way to uh, make it more efficient was uh, to put together the uh, producing and marketing companies. And that, of course, is what he did very successfully. Rockefeller operated by what he one time dubbed our plan. And our plan was to gain control of all of the American oil refining industry and to lift it out of what he saw was this wasteful competition, and he was gonna make it into one combination, and he was gonna be the boss of it. In 1871, he got his first chance. The railroad companies who were planning to raise their rates approached him with a secret plan under which the small independent producers would end up subsidizing Rockefeller through a form of hidden payment to him called a drawback. Now, a drawback was a particularly uh, mean-spirited form of a rebate in which a man like Rockefeller with, with market power, with, with 
considerable quantities of, of oil and refined goods to ship, could actually go to a railroad and demand part of his competitor's railroad rate, so that a competitor might pay $1.50 a barrel of oil, and John D. Rockefeller might get 30 to 40 cents of that rate without his competitor even knowing it. If you were powerful enough to demand drawbacks, your competitor, in practical terms, had no chance to survive. The railroad would channel Rockefeller's drawbacks through the South Improvement Company. At 15, Ida Tarbell was old enough to remember what followed when the news of the conspiracy leaked out. An uneasy rumor began running up and down the creek. Freight rates were going up. On the morning of February 26, 1872, the oil men read in their morning papers that the rise had come. Moreover, all members of the South Improvement Company were exempt. The independents reacted with fury. Rage swept through the oil region. 3,000 men marched through the town and went into the Titusville Opera House and denounced the octopus and the, and the 40 thieves. It was the beginning of the oil war. If the South Improvement Scheme succeeded, railroad charges would shoot up. As the independents fought back, one of their leaders was Franklin Tarbell. Franklin Tarbell and his fellow townsmen, his fellow independents, would meet in the evenings to discuss what they were going to do about the fact that they were losing so much money. They formed the Petroleum Producers Union and vowed to sell no oil to anyone associated with the South Improvement Company. For weeks, the whole body of oilmen abandoned regular business and surged from town to town, intent on destroying the monster, the 40 Thieves, the Great Anaconda, as they called the mysterious South Improvement Company. The South Improvement scheme was exposed by the press, and Rockefeller's name appeared on a blacklist. It is not the business of the public to change our private contracts. It is easy to write newspaper articles, but we have other business. Certainly, Grandfather knew the way his business should be run. As far as I know, he did not break any laws. It's unclear whether it was legal. It certainly, uh, from our present lights, was highly immoral, and today it would be illegal in the context of uh, the unfettered post-Civil War uh, uh, 19th century capitalism uh, if you could get away with it, you got away with it. I was governed simply by that which seemed to be best for the interests of our company and nothing else. Rockefeller had a wide array of practices which were not strictly illegal in the time. He was an expert at predatory pricing. He was an expert at using uh, the rebate system. He was an expert at industrial espionage and spy systems. Rockefeller was so obsessed with secrecy that his company, Standard Oil, had its own code book. In it, a code word for standard oil was club, and Rockefeller himself was chowder. Rockefeller forced the railroads to spy on his competitors and report to him how much oil they were shipping, where it was going, and what price it was getting. I wonder what general ever sends out a brass band in advance to notify the enemy that he will begin an attack. Rockefeller and his colleagues talked about the conquest and refining in terms of war and peace. They would move into a city, they would say, come and join us, or if you don't join us, we'll, you'll be crushed. They would come in and either through companies that were clearly standard oil or through what were called blind tigers, through other companies that they secretly owned, they would cut prices. That was what was called giving their competitors a good sweating. And they would force their competitors either to make a compromise, come to terms with them, join the Standard Oil Trust, or the other choice, go out of business. On a summer's day, a Cleveland photographer posed a group of the city's leading refiners. Before long, everyone in the picture would be working for Rockefeller or out of business. Rockefeller said, you can't compete with the standard. If you refuse to sell, it will end in your being crushed. Robert Hanna, refiner. It was stated that they had a contract with the railroads by which they could run us into the ground if they pleased. W.H. Duane, refiner. <laughs> 
We should be crushed out if we did not go into that arrangement. We sold at a sacrifice, and we were obliged to. John Alexander, refiner. Among those who were driven to the wall in what was later known as the Cleveland Conquest was Rockefeller's own brother, Frank. His comments went unrecorded. Those people who were forced by his competitive practices to sell out their companies to him were resentful. Um, on the other hand, um, those, he always offered them standard oil stock or cash. Those who accepted the standard oil stock, many of them became very wealthy indeed, and I think many of them were very glad that they did it. By now, Rockefeller was, in his own words, independently rich outside of oil. He could well afford a home on Euclid Avenue, the best address in Cleveland. But unlike the other robber barons of his day, he avoided vulgarity and garish ostentation. In his own house, he maintained a curious frugality. He was a pillar of the local Baptist church and still taught Sunday school. Mr. Rockefeller was good. There was no more faithful Baptist in Cleveland than he. Every enterprise of that church he had supported liberally from his youth. He gave to its poor. He visited its sick. He wept with its suffering. Moreover, he gave unostentatiously to many charities of whose worthiness he was satisfied. The public at large in the late 19th century uh, became obsessed with this image of the Baptist Sunday school teacher uh, who would leave the church on Sunday, uh, go into the competitive arena, and ruthlessly crush his competitors. I don't think that Rockefeller saw a contradiction. He thought he was playing by the rules of capitalism. He was bringing a better order to the way things were done. And so I don't think that on Sundays he felt bad about what he was going to do on Monday morning. He had divided his, his life into compartments. In his own image, he was a highly religious man. And yet, as a businessman, he felt that he was on a lifetime mission to impose order on this major new industry. I believe the power to make money is a gift of God. Having been endowed with a gift, I believe it is my duty to make money, and still more money, and to use the money I make for the good of my fellow man. Rockefeller had named his company Standard Oil to suggest a safe and reliable product. He made it his mission, as well as his motto, to give the poor man his cheap light. By now, oil and the kerosene lamp had transformed the lives of ordinary people and even the clock by which they lived. In western Pennsylvania, there was plenty of evidence of the waste that Rockefeller so abhorred. The hills were already littered with abandoned oil wells and tanks. They're still there today. Drake's well had gone out of business, and the colonel himself was to die in pain and poverty. All this made John D. Rockefeller more determined than ever to gain complete mastery over the new oil industry. Ida Tarbell once likened Rockefeller to Napoleon as he poured over a map with little red pegs on it each peg a rival refinery that he'd conquered or forced to surrender. At the beginning of the 1870s, Rockefeller controlled one-tenth of the refining capacity in the United States. Over that decade, he waged war throughout the northeast of the United States to gain control of refineries in city after city. Within nine years, he and his colleagues controlled 90% of the refining capacity in the United States. In the oil region itself, one of his instruments would be Acme Oil, a classic blind tiger, clandestinely controlled by Rockefeller, but ostensibly headed by a well-known independent called John Archbold. 
His secret orders were to acquire all the refineries along Oil Creek. He had once led the independence against Rockefeller. Now it would be his task to crush them. It was a battle that would pit the values of the 19th century against those of the 20th. They were appalled by the rise of the modern corporation. Well, it was in fact a threat to their, their way of life. And it concerned them and they, it frightened them. It's hard for us in the 20th century to remember that when John D. entered the oil industry, there were essentially four different industries. It was oil production, refining, transportation, and marketing, uh, generally populated by different companies, different people, uh, and seen as, as separate industries. His historical function, and indeed the definition of vertical integration, was to take those four and make them into one company. The day of combination is here to stay. Individualism has gone, never to return. It all seemed so undemocratic and un-American to the small family businesses in the oil region. Franklin Tarbell believed very much in being his own man, in working for himself. He believed that it was almost uh, a sign of lack of moral fiber to work for someone else. Franklin Tarbell saw that independents were throwing in their lot with John D. Rockefeller and giving up their freedom as far as he was concerned. That was his moral judgment. What Ida Tarbell saw was the human cost of the great combination and the anxiety and unhappiness it caused her own father. There was great financial tension in the home. Their fortunes were up and down constantly. Some people, including her father's partner, went bust because of John D. Rockefeller. Franklin was liable for his debts, his partner's debts, and so this caused a great a great problem for them. I really don't recall grandfather t talking about Ida Tarbell. Perhaps he did. She was very resentful of what it had done for her father because her father had been one of those who had been forced out of business and foolishly, as it turned out, didn't accept uh, Standard Oil stock in payment. Had he done so, he would have been much better off. The independent oil men would make one last attempt to break the stranglehold of John D. Rockefeller. At the end of the 1870s, they decided to build the world's first long-distance pipeline. Nothing like it had ever been tried before. Speed was essential, but Rockefeller could still count on the support of the railroads to help him stamp out this insurrection. Where pipelines came to railroads, the railroad still wouldn't give the right-of-way uh, to them, and so they would take the oil and pump it out of the pipeline into a wagon and haul it 30 or 40 feet across the railroad tracks and dump it back into the pipeline. The railroads, to prevent this kind of crossing of their tracks, would just simply park a train there for long periods of time. When the independent pipeline succeeded, Rockefeller built a whole network of his own. It was bigger and better and 400 miles long. Standard Oil was nicknamed the Old House, but it was the shape of things to come. From its new headquarters in New York City, its board of directors looked out on a worldwide empire. Standard Oil was one of the first great multinational corporations with a truly global reach. Three of its giant refineries produced 25% of the world's entire kerosene consumption. Rockefeller's empire controlled 90% of the oil refined in the United States and virtually monopolized its transport. With a workforce twice the size of the U.S. Army, Standard Oil was a household name around the world. Yet the strain of building a corporation so gigantic that it had its own fleet of ships took its toll on Rockefeller. Work by day and worry by night, week in and week out, month after month, all the fortune I have made has not served to compensate me for the anxiety of that period. It was as an illumination merchant that John D. Rockefeller became the richest man in America. And 
What most people don't understand is that the oil industry in its first 40 years was an illumination business. It was a kerosene business. An invention from Thomas Edison's laboratory was about to shake the empire of standard oil to its foundations. Edison's development of the light bulb really was a major threat, not immediately, but long run to the oil business, particularly to its urban markets where electricity could be hooked up. So somewhere you could look ahead and say 20, 25 years from then, the oil business was gonna be in trouble. But just a few years later came a rescue. It was first in Europe, where the automobile was developed, and then even more so in the United States, where in the 1890s, a number of uh, tinkerers and inventors developed the automobile further, and in particular, one, Henry Ford. Henry Ford had once worked in Edison's laboratory as a technician. Ford's assembly line production of motor cars would eventually create a whole new market for petroleum. In the meantime, his former boss, Thomas Edison, had developed his own car, powered not by gasoline, but by electricity. Until as late as 1912, electric cars were a common sight. They had their own showrooms, garages, and charge-up stations. What ensured the victory of the gasoline-powered engine was cheap and almost unlimited quantities of oil. Until the internal combustion engine, gasoline had been an all but worthless byproduct of petroleum. New fines and new oil fields meant new worries for Rockefeller. Rockefeller's near monopoly was based on northeastern oil fields, Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia. The discovery of vast new fields in the southwest and in the west uh, greatly undermined his ability to control the oil industry. These new fields were much more prolific than the traditional fields in the northeast. It was most difficult for Standard Oil to maintain its monopoly when other companies were in on the ground floor of these new fields and had tremendous sources of crude oil. Of all the new oil fields, none could compete with Spindletop, Texas. It was 1859 all over again, and then some. People rushed from all over the country to make their fortunes. Texan Tall Talk gave the oil industry a new vocabulary with words like roughneck and roustabout, and new companies like Sun and Texaco. Texas at the turn of the century was still a predominantly rural society. Proud Texans, uh, very fearful of outside influence. They saw Rockefeller as a foreigner and they called Standard Oil a foreign corporation. Once the giant new oil fields were discovered in Texas, Texans and their politicians and their newspapers became obsessed, in their words, with protecting God's wealth in Texas from John D. Rockefeller. And as the oil fields spread throughout the country, the mid-continent field, Texas, California, he faced the same kind of controversy every step of the way. As each year went by, he seemed to become more and more hated, the very embodiment of the trust and the monopoly that the American people were beginning to revolt against. More than anyone else, the man who symbolized the great antitrust sentiment of the day was the dynamic young president, Theodore Roosevelt. A powerful personality. One journalist said that after you meet him, you have to wring his personality out of your clothes. He was so captured people and was so strong. Teddy Roosevelt was not against all monopoly combinations, but he was gunning for Standard Oil. United States is all the flame. They say that feller is to blame. Or is that just a thing to say when he has all the fines to pay? I'm sure I know how you'd finance if you could get next to the chance. It's just as plain as ABC. 
you do the same as Johnny B. Oil, oil, oil has got us in its toil that Teddy says the trusts have got to go. And when this man behind gets a thing set in his mind, you can bet your bottom dollar will be so. Teddy Roosevelt had made the trusts the burning issue of the day when the editor of McClure's magazine decided to run a major series on the monopolies. It was perhaps inevitable that the assignment would go to Ida Tarbell. Not only had she grown up in the oil region, but at the age of 44 she was one of the most successful magazine writers in the country and had three influential biographies to her name. Ida Tarbell tracked Rockefeller for almost a year. We were neither apologists or critics, only journalists intent on discovering what had gone into the making of this most perfect of all monopolies. I soon discovered that I must work in a persistent fog of suspicion, doubt and fear. Her first article in November 1902 was a bombshell. For the next two years, the nation was gripped by a series of exposés which appeared in McClure's magazine. She never denied what she called the true greatness of Standard Oil, but her articles would spell disaster for the Rockefeller empire. I never had an animus against their size and wealth. I was willing that they should combine and grow as big and rich as they could, but only by legitimate means. But they had never played fair, and that ruined their greatness for me. Clue by clue, Ida Tarbell uncovered the secret history of Standard Oil. She learned of the Cleveland Conquest, the oil wars, the crushings and sweatings, the ciphers, the codes, the spies, the rebates and the drawbacks. The smoking gun was that someone brought to her uh, records from the railroads showing that Rockefeller had been given special rates, that Rockefeller was being charged much less than his competitors. He had a special deal. And this was, in fact, illegal. So uh, her articles became much stronger. And as they became stronger, people came forward and gave her a little more help and a few more stories. In fact, John D. Rockefeller's brothers came to her with their own stories about John D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller's response was a simple quotation, let the world wag. He attempted a little joke about Ida Tarbell, calling her Ida Tarbarrel. But he was wrong. The man who had foreseen the industrial future of the 20th century had underestimated the power of the press and of public opinion in the new age of mass democracy. Rockefeller had had, had a, a long tradition of, of intense secrecy about his operations. Uh, Ida Torbell exposed such practices for the first time to many in the nation, and the nation was appalled. This, on top of the state attacks on Rockefeller, on top of the legal attacks through the court system, uh, meant that Rockefeller uh, had no place to hide by 1905, 1906, and in some ways the Supreme Court decision became inevitable. On a hot, muggy day in May 1911, the Supreme Court justices came to case number 398. They had to rule on whether or not Standard Oil was an illegal monopoly. That same day in New York, the executives of Standard Oil stood around a ticker tape machine at 26 Broadway awaiting the verdict. The news when it came was worse than they had feared. Standard Oil was given six months to dissolve itself. There was a shocked silence. Then John Archbold, now head of Standard Oil, started to whistle. He walked over to the mantelpiece and he said, Well, gentlemen, life's just one damn thing after another. Ida thought it was a hollow victory because she wanted to see John D. Rockefeller in jail. I don't think it was a hollow victory. His operation was broken up with evidence that she had marshaled. And what happened basically is that the great business of oil had to flow within the banks of the law. It was now the second oil age. Gasoline would speed the growth of corporate giants like Mobil, 
Exxon, Chevron, and Amoco, all descended from the company that fueled the Wright brothers' first flight, John B. Rockefeller Standard Oil. I think my grandfather was a pioneer in the frontier of capitalism, and I really don't believe that the economic power of the United States would have been as great had he not united the oil industry in our country. Rockefeller and Standard Oil did as much as any group to create a global economy. Not only did they dominate the oil industry in the United States, but it reached all around the world. On the other hand, however, we have the, the uncomfortable legacy. Uh, the, the public hatred of John D. Rockefeller translated into a hatred for big oil, indeed for big business. The public skepticism, certainly born in this period, and that has to be seen as another lasting legacy of the great John D. Rockefeller may have suffered a moral defeat, but he held stocks in standard successors, and as they rose, his fortune doubled. With his millions, he led world crusades against epidemic meningitis and yellow fever, and founded the University of Chicago, and one of the first colleges for black women. There have been people who said that his giving was merely to, to try to uh, assuage the, uh, the evils that he had done, and this was a way of paying penance. I don't think that was true at all. And yet somehow the old gentleman who loved to play golf and sing hymns never lived down the reputation that resulted from Ida Tarbell's articles. You all sing it, you know it. Yes, we'll all sing it for our course. Shall they both? I'll oh, yeah. yeah. sing boys, passing boys. He has led a life devoted to charity and church, true. But the Rockefeller practice of separating morals from the business in hand is threatening all forms of American life with commercial Machiavellism. It is this which forces a study of John D. Rockefeller. The secret of Mr. Rockefeller hired a public relations man. Newsreel cameras were welcomed and his public image began to change. I am very grateful to you and to a host of people who are so kind and good to me all the time. Why, because you're so good to everybody. Yes, you are. <laughs> John D. Rockefeller died in 1937. Here in Florida, where he posed for his first movies 15 years ago, John D. Rockefeller died, 25 months short of his cherished ambition to round out a century of life. Once he was the world's richest man, its first billionaire. Now he passes into history as the greatest philanthropist of all time, a man who gave away $530 million. Late in her own life, Ida Tarbell was asked what she would change if she rewrote her famous articles. Not one word, young man. Not one word. Next, on the prize, Empires of Oil. American oil brought change to the world and profits to America. Now, colorful foreign entrepreneurs craved a piece of the action, searching the globe for more oil. But it would take a world war for mankind to truly understand the awesome power of its black treasure. Based on the Pulitzer Prize-winning book by Daniel Yergin, The Prize.